Mark chapter 8. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and said unto them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and had nothing to eat. Three days of no food. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way. For divers, different kinds of them, came from far. Jesus has compassion on the people, unlike religion. Religious will say, Come bring all that you got and then go home. Well, I'm not, I can't go, I, just go, get out of here. And his disciples answered him. From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? Did they forget something? Did they truly forget something? And he, and he asked them, How many loaves have you? Shouldn't that rang a bell? And they said, Seven. Would you have last time? And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break. Sound familiar, guys? And gave his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. Sound familiar? And they had a few small fishes. Sound familiar? And he blessed them and commanded to set them before, also before them. So they did eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left, seven baskets. Notice the meat can be bread and doesn't have to be ham, pork chops, hamburger. So we early gathered 12 baskets. And because of our unbelief, we only gathered seven. We lost out on five baskets. I think seven five. And they never did remember. They never did get it. And we don't ever get it. And we don't ever count our blessings. And we hardly ever remember what God has done for us. We're always thinking right now. The troubles right now. Never thanking God and praising God and memorializing God for something that he's already done for us. And at this moment, we should say, hey, he's already done this in our life. Let's go with the flow and see what happens this time. And they had eaten were about 4,000. Last time, 5,000. And he sent them away. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples. Just like last time. And came into the parts of Dalmanutha. Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came for but uh oh And began to question with him. Seeking of him a sign from heaven. Tempting him. You get that? Jesus give us something, but we're just doing it to, to prove who you are. A sign from heaven. You know what that is? That's when you go to these, these markets and these fairs and these these festivals. You see an airplane go flying by. It's got a little banner behind it. That's a, that's a sign from heaven. Eat at Joe's. And, Get your auto insurance. Get it. Sign from him. Get it. Airplane. There's no belief. They only want to accuse him. And if he would give them a sign, they wouldn't have believed it anyway. They'd probably yell at him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. Look at that. Jesus as human and as God is like, you know. He's astonished at these guys. 
He's There's one guy at the farmer's market. I just What's wrong with you? Why does this generation seek after a sign? Well, Jews require a sign. And that's not the question because the motive here is to pin him down to tempt him. It's not they're really looking. Jesus knows that Jews require a sign. That's no problem. He's been healing. He's been feeding miraculously. But here comes these people that don't believe in him. Why are you asking me? That'd be like somebody who professes to be an atheist and start coming up to you and start asking you stupid questions. Here we go. Well, how did Noah get all the animals in the ark? Who was Cain's wife? Blah, blah. Can a God make a rock that's so big? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, shut up. Because if I did answer your questions with the Bible, you're not going to believe it. That's what's going on here. 2,000 years later, it's still the same story. We're still dealing with the same Pharisees. And if Jesus, you know, these people come up to you, and if the rapture happened that moment, they would find some other means explaining why your clothes and your blood are left behind. Aliens. He was a figment of my imagination. He was never really there. He was a ghost. Spirits. And that's why Jesus is saying, is, you don't believe me. Why are you wasting my time? And I've had that happen many times. People don't care about God, and they're just, I had that at the prison, you get the guys come up to you, and they're just there to get out of their jail cell. And you're wasting time for somebody who really searching, and it gets aggravating. So he sighs, showing that God is human, and human is God in Jesus. Why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you. There shall no sign be given unto this generation. Ooh. But he just did a sign for them. The miraculous 4,000 feeding. But they want more. If you can't get 4,000 people being fed by, I mean, what was seven? And two fish? If that's not good enough for you, what do you want? I'll tell you what these Pharisees wanted. They wanted God to come down in the flesh. We got that right. And they wanted God to bow down before them. Oh, you're doing such a great job. Oh, look at the control you have over the people. Almighty Pharisee. And Jesus is not going to do that. You ever watch the Pope when he comes to countries, how he bows down before that leader of that nation, that, and the leader of that nation bows down before? That's what they wanted. And he left them, entering into a ship again, departed together. <laughs> we want a sign. Ain't got no sign to you. Bye. See you later. He left them. He got back in the ship and went left. What would Jesus do? Get out of here. Bye. See you. <laughs> People who did not want God, he said, see you later. Bye. I'm not going to waste my time with you. Even when you ask a stupid question, I'm not wasting my time with you. Bye. Some people don't realize that God sometimes can be, let me say, reverently cruel than what Americans think. God will take a Christ-rejecting sodomite, a Christ-rejecting Hollywoodian, a Christ-rejecting liar, a Christ-rejecting politician, and cast them into hell without even casting a sweat because they rejected Jesus Christ. That's not the American way. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Okay. Normal. Let's read as we go along. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. So, looks like to me there's one loaf of bread. Not two. Maybe half a loaf. And he charged them. Now he's going to put their faith in what just happened into play charged them who the disciples saying take heed beware of the leaven of the pharisees 
and of the leaven of Herod. That's kind of weird wording, isn't it? How that is worded. Read verse by verse. And they, the disciples, reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. So he just told you the bread they ate was leavened bread. They were, they were allowed to eat. The, it's not a, it's not the Passover or anything like that. They weren't allowed to have the leavened bread. Jesus knows that there's a, there's something on the boat that that's bread. He uses the bread to catch their attention, and they're like, "We have no bread." Verse fourteen: There is no bread. We didn't bring up, and we're hungry. And when Jesus knew, he said unto them, Why reason ye, because you have no bread? Well, you just said, Take ye to bear of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, Jesus. You want a sandwich? You want a sardine sandwich? You want a salmon sandwich? What, what are you talking about? Perceive ye not yet, neither understandeth? Have ye your heart yet hardened? And we read that a couple chapters ago. Yes. Where was it? Um, verse 52 of chapter 6. And they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. That first sign that Jesus did the, the 5,000 people were fed the disciples left that situation with a hard heart that's why they never got it over here in chapter 8 their heart condition prevented them from getting what happened and now Jesus brings back not the 4,000 he brings back the 5,000 by saying your heart he left off where their heart condition was hardened now, what's a remarkable statement about that between chapter 6 and chapter 8? Look at 721. A message that the disciples heard. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murder, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lascivious, evil nine, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these things. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. You got a hardened heart, boys? You got a heart condition right now. Your heart condition, your hardened heart has got you from not getting what God is trying to show you. All 12 of you. You, you did what a Roman Catholic will do. When I said beware the leaven of Pharisees, the leaven of Herod, you thought of bread, food. You thought of the physical, to please yourself. Eat, drink, and be merry. That's what you guys thought of. And yet you forgot, I fed 5,000 people. I fed 4,000 people. I think I could take care of 12. Don't you think at that moment those disciples were really starving to death? Do you think Jesus would call to the war and say, all right, spit up a couple fish? No. What did Jesus do when they were fishing after his resurrection? Didn't they not catch anything? Oh, cast your nets on the right side of the fish. And they caught so many fish, the nets were going to break and the boat was going to sink. I can feed you guys. But you're missing the whole point. Having eyes, see ye not. Talking to the disciples. Didn't you just see what happened before? Haven't you seen what I've done? And having ears, hear ye not? And do ye not remember? Remember what? Chapter 6, chapter 8. What I said in chapter 7. Don't you guys get it? And as humans, guess what? We don't get it. In the relationship of the Word of God, we are stupid. And if you don't call yourself stupid, you're stupid for thinking you're not stupid with the Word of God. I was reading chapter 8 today for, for tonight's study. I was saying, wow, 
chapter 7, I missed something that refers back to chapter 6. I couldn't get full chapter 7 without seeing new things. I'm just as bad with the Word of God. I don't get it all the time. I have no idea what God is doing. And it could be plain and simple right in front of the, my nose and my face. And I'm not picking on the disciples because I'm just as bad as they are. I forget what God's done for me in the past on present problems now. They're worried about eating. And Jesus is trying to warn them about these Pharisees and their doctrine. And it has to be important because he's telling the 12 disciples, hey, you better not listen to these guys. You better not listen to their doctrine. You better not listen to their teaching. Maybe they were listening. Oh, but my stomach's rumbling. And I fall in that condemnation too, just as much as the disciple. When I break the five loaves among 5,000, now here we go, back chapter 6. How many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They said unto him, 12. I wonder what kind of add 12. Well, I mean, how did they say it? And. The seven among 4,000, chapter 8, how many baskets full of, fra full of fragments took ye up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, how is it that ye do not understand? And then we're told in, in other gospels that he's talking about the doctrine. Well, I'm not talking about physical bread. And then with that matthew i mean mark chapter 8 and matthew 15 isn't that a great thing to say if, if a church tells you to physically eat bread as a piece of a body of a human isn't that enough to say hey wait a minute that's wrong because that is doctrine of a, per, uh, of a particular church to eat a human bread and jesus said to the son you didn't get it right Stop worrying about your belly and get with the principles of God. He's out there are people out there who are teaching false doctrine. That is the main issue right now in this boat. It's not eating. Jesus told Satan, man shall not live by bread alone. Job said, I have seen the word of God more than my necessary food. We eat more food as Americans than we digest our Bibles. And God is recording how much we eat breakfast, noon, dinner, supper, and snacks. And he's also recording how much we read. And the question that comes to all of us, how much can the Holy Spirit survive daily on the food that you give him through the word of God? Jesus said, I'm the water of life. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Jesus said, the word of God is milk. This is a daily diet. And many Christians starve because they don't feast on the Word of God. Oh, I don't have no bread to make a sandwich. How much bread have you got reading for the Holy Spirit to feed on? And then don't digest the religious meals. Don't eat their meals. Eat the Word of God. That will have you survive. And he comes to Bethsaida. And they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. So here's somebody bringing a friend, somebody who's blind. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. They walk out of Bethsaida. He has abandoned Bethsaida because of judgment, Matthew 11, 21 to 24. We are, he's, he's going to tell the disciples about his death, burial, and resurrection. There are cities now, there are places just utterly just rejected Jesus Christ and his word. And I'm not going to do nothing in there. I've got to pull you out. 
and that's with our that's with our countries that's with our our states that's our divisions that's our commonwealths that's our cities that's our towns it could even be in our homes because unbelief God he can't do nothing there he's got to pull this man out and let him out of town when he had spit on his eyes now this guy could not see what was done he can only hear the sound of oh. Did I just hear spit? The deaf and unable to speak guy saw the spit. This is twice in Mark that Jesus has used holy spit. He spit on his eyes. You know that's a shame. That, that's just somebody came up to you preaching the gospel and they spit. That's that's supposed to be you know degrading. And put his hands upon him, and he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, "I now this is something. I see men as trees walking." Do you know the very first commandment to man is about a tree? You know there is remarkable things in this Bible about trees. You know how much time God spends about trees? And we don't even know the full details of the birth of Jesus Christ, but we know stuff about trees. You know, Solomon used the best timber he could for the temple and he overlaid it with gold and silver the Bible uses parables and men as trees trees are like in the men because they have family roots branches family tree I see men as trees walking after that he put his hands again on his eyes and made him look up he was restored and saw every man clearly. What was that little episode about trees walking? What was that intermission? I have no idea, but you know what the Holy Spirit said? Mark, yes sir, write that. And I see man as trees. Uh, God, are you, you really sure? You, you just write it down. Why? Just write it down. Why did he see men as trees walking? I have no idea, but that's important. What will modern Bible say? There's a nugget there, and I don't know what that nugget is. Maybe somebody does. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, Bethsaida, nor tell it to any in the town. Bethsaida has been a forsaken city, and I got a remarkable book that you can get about the architect not the architect archaeology of that city it's a city that should have survived but when God curses it when God puts something upon it and Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi and by the way, he asked his disciples, by the way, he means as they're walking, they're walking down the road straight, and they're talking. Ooh, that's a nice tree over there. You put a lot of effort when you made that, God. Yeah. So, boys, what? Whom do men say that I am? Having a conversation, like the, like the road in Emilius. They answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias. And others, one of the prophets. And they're walking. And he says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? All right. Who do people say I am, guys? Mm, yeah. All right, now who do you think I am? See, it doesn't care what people think. I'd be afraid to ask some people what they think of Jesus Christ. I couldn't write down maybe some of their words they would say. 
And these disciples have been preaching. They've been hanging out with Jesus. They've been everywhere. What are they saying about me, boys? See, the disciples have a little power hungry. They, they want to know who's the greatest. They want to be, you know, sit at this seat. They want all that. And they're, and they're you know, get these people away from us. Well, who do they say I am? Well, who do you think I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ, the anointed one of God. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. That's what Christians today want God to tell them. Are you saved? Yeah, you're born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. 100% what the Bible says about the gospel of believing Jesus. Yeah, now don't go tell anybody. All right. Great. Thank you, Lord. And you know it's true. You know there are churches out there where they're Christians and they don't say nothing about Jesus. They would love this commandment to be written on the walls of their church. But why would he tell his disciples? They have been preaching. They have been showing signs. Why would Jesus at this point tell them, shut up? It's something remarkable to think about. He's on his way to Calvary. The date is 32 AD. Do you know what God said about man in Noah's day? They can do anything they imagine. The imagination of men is just wicked and evil. He just dealt with the Pharisees. He just took a man out of a city to heal him. Who do people think I am? They don't think I'm God. Peter does. So don't tell them because they don't believe it. They're not going to listen. And if you profess to be, to say who I am, you're going to be in high trouble with the, with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. And I need you guys later on in the book of Acts. You're going to open your mouth in the book of Acts right now. Just let me go to Calvary. Let nothing stop us going to Calvary. Let's get Calvary done. Let's get the tomb. Let's get the empty tomb. Let's get me seated at the right hand of the Father. Let's get that done. Come on, boys. I got a job to do. Let nothing interfere. Don't say nothing because they ain't going to believe you anyway. And there are times it may be your own family, maybe somebody you're working with. It may be. Stop. Stop talking about Jesus. They're not going to believe. The only thing you can do is now is pray. Go find somebody else to witness to. Go find somebody else who will listen. And he began to teach them. Now watch. Tells them to hush, quiet. He began to teach them. Teaching means doctrine. Here's a doctrine of Jesus Christ. You ready? Because this is based upon my salvation today. That the Son of Man must suffer many things. He must be born again. Jesus had to be abused and suffer. And be rejected of the elders. So don't tell them who I am. And of the chief priests, don't tell them who I am. And the scribes, don't tell them who I am. And be killed. And after three days. Rise again. Notice how Mark. Took the whole church out. Going by the doctrines of Jesus Christ. You can't find a Catholic church. In the, in the gospel of Mark. Mark does not record. Jesus saying anything to Peter. About this rock. You find that in Matthew. A Jewish book. Not Mark, a servant book. He goes from who I am, you're the Christ. 
All right, don't say anybody. I'm going to Calvary. Here I go. And he spanked that saying openly. And Peter, now remember, they're talking. They're walking, verse 27. Who do people think I am? Oh, okay. Who do you think I am? Okay. I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to rise again. Peter stops the, the, the walk. Peter took him. Took him. And he begins to rebuke. He stops. Hey, Jesus. Shut up. You're not going to die. They're not going to do that to you. What's wrong with you, God? And he does it out of love for Jesus. He, he really loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he don't want you to go. And when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, all of them, he rebuked Peter. Now here's a rebuking party. Saying, get thee behind me. Say, oh, look at that. Mark put that in there. Mark left the church out and said, Satan. For thou savest not the things be of God, but the things that be of men. Listen, Peter, I know you love me. I know you care. I know you have compassion, but I got to do this by God. Don't worry, we'll have eternity to be together. Well, he's not, he didn't say that, but that's what's going to happen, isn't it? I've heard people pick on Peter. Peter loves the Lord Jesus. Man, he picked up a sword and was going to face the whole entire army. You think he would have won? One sword against everybody. And when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. Those words were spoken before he ever went to his cross. Can you imagine what the people are thinking now? He hasn't died on the cross yet. He just told them, okay, everybody. You want to follow me? Let's put it down in context. You take up that Roman crucifixion and follow me. And that's not what he's talking about. That cross is death. That cross is a is a life that you got to crucify yourself. He's also telling him what way he's going to die. But he hasn't gone to the cross yet. Remember? He's speaking parables to them. And then this thing is preached all through the book of Acts. Later on, disciples, oh, that's what he meant by his cross. And Peter literally is, is, is written in history that he did die on a cross. But he was persecuted. And whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. A person for today in the church age, a person who will not give up his sinful, dreadful, wicked life, will not get saved. It's impossible. Because in order to be saved, you got to repent. And if you're smoking marijuana and doing drugs and all that, and you're pleased with it, and you're happy with it, don't bow your head and ask God to save you. If you're not willing to give that up, or try to give it up, or put it on a cross to say, I'm going to fight it. The first step in true believing and being saved to be a Christian is you got to repent. And that means you got to put your body under subjection. You got to put your body in a grave and bury it and let God live through you. If you don't struggle with sin, you're not saved. 
if you go around prouding that you are a sinner and God loves you too, no, he don't. Because when you come to Calvary, you're supposed to deposit your sins upon him. Now, you'll take some sins, but you'll be taking off those sins, putting them back on, taking them off, putting them back on, and maybe God will give you grace and you take it off, and you don't get that one no more, but you'll still have sins. But you'll fight God. Remember, we we don't fight a physical war. We have a spiritual war. And the biggest battle we have is our own flesh, Paul says. And where Paul says, that what I want to do, I don't do. But that what I do, I don't, don't do. I don't want to sin, but I do. I want to go out and pass out tracts, but I don't. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? That's a remarkable statement there in Mark. Because somebody offered Jesus Christ the entire world. What was the cost? What's that? Well, right now, what shall a man give in exchange? No. What? For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You can get all the material wealth, all the material goods, you can fall down before Satan. As Satan told Jesus he can get. If you fall down and worship. And then lose your soul. And Matthew 10 tells us. That God has the power not only to destroy our body. But to destroy our soul into hell. Life is not the physical. Life is the spiritual. What you do with Jesus Christ, that is life. You can be, there are people who live to 100 years old, maybe a little longer. What is that? What is 100 years old when you choose to continue to reject Jesus Christ and die and go off into eternity where there is no more time? Come to Jesus Repentively come to Jesus humbly ask him to save you ask him to about your sins be washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ And then whatever how many years you live you'll go off in eternity to be with him forever The whole world will burn up the Bible says in Revelation 19 and 20 What shall a man give in exchange for his soul what can you pay God that you don't go to hell? You're going to open up your checkbook? Sorry. And it's recorded in a funny book. Look at, at we'll go to Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. What shall a man give for exchange of his soul? There's an answer. I'll read the whole verse. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, God, which he, God, has purchased with his own blood. How do you pay for your soul? You need God's blood. Now, how does Muslims do that when they shed Christian? Satan's got them believing that a Christian's blood is God's blood. Or something to that effect. Because they go out and kill Christians and infidels. You walk up to God, and this is not going to happen, but in order for God to allow you into heaven, he wants to see the blood of his son who is him. No blood, no heaven. 
according to Acts 20, 28. Everything else, you're damned. That's how it's so important what Jesus done. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words. In this adulterous and sinful generation. Talk about where the Jews are right now. Things are going to change after the resurrection. Things are going to change in the book of Acts. Acts is a transitional book. Things change. But right now, present, 32 AD. As Jesus is speaking right now, if you are ashamed of what he said. Now, in the present, as Jesus is speaking. And my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. We have jumped all the way over to the second advent. We have skipped Calvary and run to the second advent of Jesus Christ. What he's saying to those Jews right now in the tribulation, if you don't do what the word of God says and you are ashamed, You're damned. After teaching the disciples, you better be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the... Somebody else. Leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of... Herod. You better never mind the religion. You better never mind the government. You better get my words right and you better not be ashamed of them. Because when I come back, it ain't my words. You in trouble. What's the, what's the doctrine of the government? Receive the mark. What's the doctrine of the religion? Worship the devil. You better have my word. What's my word say? Get out of here when he comes. When he says on desolation, you better get out of here. You better not do it on the Sabbath. You better, you better follow the law. 